Yeah, so my paper um, is a um, lab, um, it's from a lab experiment in South Africa. It is joint work with uh, John Ryan, who is a postdoc at the University of Cape Town. Um, so we know that high inequality is, um, as in this conference, I don't need to motivate the paper that much, but we know that high inequality is a problem for. Do we? Uh. For many, for many reasons, um, uh, one of the reasons why it's a problem is because it, it has, it's associated with a bunch of uh, a variety of risks, also on the sort of politically uh, on the political side of, of things. Um, and so, when we think of inequality like that, then one question is: Okay, how do people think about redistribution and demanding redistribution? Right? Which I think, both in South Africa and Colombia, I would imagine it's a, it's a big topic. Um, so what, what explains support for redistribution? Why do some people want more redistribution than others? So this is the demand side of the redistribution equation. Um, and here we focus on three, uh, on the role of three, uh, three factors. Uh, one is aversion to high inequality. Uh, the other one is the personal loss of uh, a more equal distribution. And then, just as a sort of sanity check, the role of luck versus merit when it comes to redistribution. And I'll, I'll explain better in a second. So the literature shows that um, we as humans have fairness considerations uh, in ourselves. So we do, th there is ample evidence that we care about um, fairness even when it doesn't involve us directly. Okay? Um, and, and this links to the inequality opportunity talk we heard from, from Chico Ferreira the other day. Inequality that arises from things that are considered uh, less fair is also more object object objectionable. And that means that we would probably s expect to see more demand for a distribution if that inequality is considered less fair. In fact, this explains a little bit the different attitudes between, for instance, Europe and the US, where in the US people tend to believe that effort is rewarded. In, in Europe we think a little more that luck has a greater role, and that might explain why we ex uh, accept more taxes than, for instance, people in the US. Um, so our contribution is, so we have all of this evidence, but it's mostly from high-income countries. So. Our first order contribution is to ask these questions in a high inequality emerging country. Okay, so that's really uh, what uh, our first contribution is. And this is a lab setting in, a, in a, uh, the University of Cape Town where we have three uh, students and I'll, I'll explain, well, the sample is more than three, but if there is three students and I'll explain how it works. Um, so why is this South Africa an interesting place to study uh, these questions? Well, South Africa, speaking of fairness and how fair inequality is, South Africa is one of those countries where the current distribution of income is a direct result of explicitly discriminatory institutions. So we can't just say, well, you know, the market is doing its thing. Well, the market is doing its thing, but you're still paying the price of a system that did not allow the majority of the population to express their full potential. So speaking of, uh, you know, merit and luck, there is no merit here, right? Um, despite all of this, however, in the World Value Survey, we don't see a high demand for redistribution in South Africa. In fact, we see comparable to other countries with much lower inequality levels. So what explains this puzzle? Why, why, an, why are South Africa not demanding more redistribution? So the experimental design works like this. I'm going to spend actually most of the presentation on this because the results are, are fairly simple. So there is a production phase in which two players are paired and they have to comp complete a, a series of tasks. And then there is a decision making, which is this third player I was talking about, this third party, we call it a stakeholder, um, that decides how to split the payment between those two players. Okay. Um, it's important to understand that the third party player is not, does not complete the task, does not participate in the production phase. It's just the person who decides who gets paid more. Okay? Um, why do we need the first phase? We could just make up some players and then do some hypothetical questions. Well, the literature shows that having real persons being 
paid real money makes the decision-making phase more binding and more realistic. So that's why we, we have the first phase with real people rather than just ask hypothetical questions. Uh, we had a total of 335 students and we had about 220 in the workers um, uh, conditions or production phase and about 115 in the decision making phase. Now our sample of interest is these guys because they are those who make the decision that we are studying. So here's the, this is the most important slide. Each of those stakeholders gets this piece of paper and they have to decide Okay, listen, you have 25 potential split of payment between player A and player B. They just completed some tasks in the other room, and now you have to decide who gets paid more. One of these 25 will be randomly selected as the payment split. So each of your decision is important because one of those is going to be the real payment. So our sample size is 116 times 25, okay? So that's how many decisions we observe. So. Here we say, we vary the, the difference between the winning player and the losing player. So this is max difference, 100 versus zero. But we also vary the cost for the third party stakeholder to redistribute, okay? So for instance, here it's zero. Whether I redistribute or not, I don't lose anything. But here is 45, which means that if I want these people to, to be more equal, in the payment split, I have to pay 45 rands, okay? So we vary both the inequality, the difference between the players. So here is 100, down here it's only 20, the difference. But we also vary the cost that the third party stakeholders incurs when deciding to split the money equally. Um, so if I circle yes, in the, for instance in this line, if I circle yes, the players get both 50% and I get 100, which is my endowment payment, minus the cost, so 85, okay? So they do this, all the stakeholders, and so we have, as I said, 25 decisions times 116 stakeholders. How does it change by how much it costs me to affect a fair distribution. So we see that it's decreasing, meaning the more I pay, uh, the less likely I am to care about fairness, so to speak. So if I lose, if you're touching my pocket, then I'm less likely to enforce an equal distribution. And we still, oh, sorry, we still have um, a difference between the lack and the many. So for each cost level, the lack people still redistribute more than, than the, the one in the merit condition, right? But it's decreasing in the cost. What about by the level of inequality? Well, the higher the split between player A and player B, the, the more likely you are to redistribute. So we interpret this as an adversion to, to inequality. So, Another important thing about this graph is that you see that the difference between the lack and merit is less relevant at high levels of inequality, which we interpret as a sort of unconditional distaste, distaste for excess inequality. So for the cost, we didn't see that. For the cost, it was the same, essentially two parallel line. Here instead, the source of the inequality, whether it's lack or merit, matters less when the difference is too much. I don't care if you were more productive than player B. You shouldn't get the whole pie, essentially. That's what this is saying. I don't care if you were more productive than player B. You shouldn't get 80-20. That's too much of a split. So this is what we are calling an unconditional distaste for inequality. This table, it's what I just told you, but it's a linear pro, uh, uh, probability model. So essentially, this is saying that higher inequality, more redistribution, higher cost, less redistribution. And this is what I was saying earlier, that there is an interaction between, between uh, um, in the inequality condition where, uh, sorry, the inequality and the merit condition interact, meaning that in what we saw here, Essentially, this is what this means, right? That inequality is more important in, as that the, 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 the source of inequality is less important at a higher level of inequality. So this is just the 
regression version of these two graphs. Um, does this matter? So what is the, you can calculate the Gini coefficient out of all the potential redistributions, right? And so the Gini coefficient that we started with, we made it similar to the real Gini coefficient of that, I think, a 0.6. So what happens after people play and redistribute? Well, in the luck condition, the Gini goes down to about 0.3, and here it goes down to about 0.35. So you see how the redistribution changes the inequality in this fictional world that we created, okay? Um, so it's important to understand what determines these levels because then the redistribution is kind of the, uh, the, the way you bring down the Gini coefficient. And that's kind of the sort of second message of our paper. So the first is that the source doesn't matter at high levels of inequality. The second one is, well, even in context like South Africa, where there is a lot of understanding of a big, a very deep understanding of the unfairness of, of the inequality in, in that country, um, clearly you have personal loss of a potential limiting factor. So this experiment actually was motivated because when we started this experiment, there was front page news in South Africa about something called expropriation without compensation. So it's part of the South African debate whether the government should take land from mostly white farmers and give it back for free to other people without compensating the white, which in other countries would sound like a crazy uh, radical distribution uh, idea. But within this context, we did this experiment because the idea is to think, okay, let's see, everybody says they want more equality, but what if I start charging you as for, for that higher uh, equality. And so essentially we're, we're interpreting this as uh, personal loss as a limiting factor for the equalizing power of redistribution. Now, because this is an experiment, we wanted to make sure that people were thinking the way we thought our experiment would make them think. So post-experiment, post we had some, uh, some um, questions about um, you know, what, you know, what made you decide uh, the way you decided and things like that. So what we find is that we analyze those, those responses and we, in a sort of qualitative way, and what we find is that, first of all, our sample, we had some questions that are similar to the one you find in the World Value Survey, which is supposed to be nationally representative. And we find that for those questions, those questions are like the ones, for instance, do you think the government should be responsible for reducing poverty, or do you think the people should be responsible for reducing poverty? So those are the type of questions, right? And we find that our sample is not systematically different than um, a nationally representative sample in the World Value Survey, so that's good. It means that our students are not uh, weird in the Joe Henry uh, sense. Um, we also found, because we didn't prime them, our, our questions were very open, we find that they mentioned the word fairness, lack, deserving, they mentioned these words a lot, which means that they were deciding about redistribution in the way that we wanted the experiment to make them think. So essentially we conclude this by, we, 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 we interpret this as a sign that um, we were eliciting social preferences, which is what the experiment is supposed to be doing. Um, and it's also clear from the post-experiment survey that the, um, the, stu the, the players understood what the experiment was about. Because that uh, little uh, decision schedule that I show is fairly complicated, right? But the student, it was clear from the responses in the post-experiment survey that they understood what they were doing. Um, so, let me summarize. This is an experiment in a high inequality context in the middle of a national discussion about fairly radical redistribution policies. So that's the context. In this experiment, and I'm, when I say front page, front page, this is stuff that was, still today actually it's discussed, but this is something that again, it's part of almost everyday discussion. How do we redistribute and how do we redress the wrongdoing of apartheid. Um, so what we find is that the higher the payment split between 
the winning player or the more productive player and the losing player or the less productive players, the more the willingness to redistribute. Result number one. Result number two, the higher the personal loss of redistributing, the less redistribution. So essentially, personal loss is a limiting factor for redistribution. More redistribution in the lack treatment, which is what I said, it's sort of very consistent with the literature. Um, and then that sort of interaction effect that I was talking about earlier. There seems to be an aversion to extreme disparities, essentially meaning that even when you think that player A should earn more than player B, because they deserve it, even in that case, if the distance between, in the payment split between player A and player B is too much, then I'm still more likely to redistribute. Connect this to the discussion, for instance, in the US about the CEO being paid, what is it, 400 times more than the person working, I don't know, in the, in the office, right? So even though perhaps the CEO deserves a little more money, does that mean they should earn 400 times more, right? So that's kind of the, 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 the analogy. And then this negative impact of personal cost uh, uh, which is not influenced by the source. So it doesn't matter whether you deserve or don't deserve to be paid more. If you're affecting me personally, then I'm, I'm going to redistribute less. Why is this uh, relevant for policy? Well, as, as I showed you, we have more in the paper, but here I just showed you one graph. It does change the post-redistribution level. So, uh, like we saw, was it yesterday in the policy session about the, I think it was Santiago Levy talking about the post, the post tax and the pre tax inequality. So, as we see, it's important. I think he was making the example the difference between Colombia and Europe, right? So, as we see, it's very important if there is redistribution or not, because it does change the, the Gini coefficient. So, again, this is an experimental setting, of course, but the intuitions are in our mind, applicable to the real world redistribution. Um, and essentially, the conclusion is that even in a setting like ours, where fairness concern are prevalent, as showed by uh, surveys and by our experiment, support for major redistributive policy, like the one I was mentioning, uh, may not be guaranteed by the, the, the existence of this fairness concern. So essentially, it's not enough for people to care about fairness. We need something that is, uh, we need a way to redistribute that um, is uh, compatible with people's personal uh, utility and, and, and not wanting to lose essentially. And I think that's it.